if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 9. As Chandler mentioned, we have a great resource, the app. Uh, the points of the sermon will be on the app. I encourage you to open your Bibles, to open up your, your Bible on your phone, and you can follow along with us. We're in a sermon series called One Small Step. This is our annual month of missions. Let me give you a little background about this, okay? <clears throat> about three years ago, a small group of people uh, were meeting with me in a conference room. And I became very convicted a few weeks before that about um, how I had led the church, to be honest with you. Um, the feeling of some failure from the standpoint of being uh, the pastor and really not pointing our people to what is most important because we fell into a, a trap that many churches fall into and that is as we think about missions and we think about witnessing to the world we think about outreach sadly we had kind of come into this traditional mindset of hey we send missionaries to go and do that kind of stuff and I came under the conviction that we were not serving our church well by having that kind of mindset. And so as we began to talk there with that small group of people, we began to build an inspirational vision around steering the ship of the church a different direction culturally. And that was really began seriously two and a half years ago. As we began to say that we are going to point believers in our church to be on mission that there is this great adventure that God has for every believer to be involved in the redemptive drama that God is working in this world. He is saving people. He is leading people to Christ. And every believer has this great privilege and joy to be a part of that adventure. And yet, sadly, Christians live their entire Christian lives never being used by God in this way, never getting outside of the comfort zone to the degree that they would be used so that they might be a witness to somebody else about the love of Christ. And we said, we're going to change. From this point on, we're going to change, and we're going to challenge our people to live on mission. We stop talking about missions, per se. Instead, we talk about being on mission, that we are joining God in the great mission of sharing the gospel with the world. And so every year, we highlight that. We spend a whole month talking about that, teaching and inspiring and painting vision of what that means for each and every individual, that we want this for you. We want you to experience that. We want you to experience the joy of being used by God so that somebody who is far from Christ can come to saving faith and you would be the instrument by which that would happen. And so that's our dream, that's our goal, and that's why we're doing this, this whole thing this month. So last week I talked about the first step, the first step to reaching those who are far from Christ is to pray that God would use us to do that. And so that, that we could be used by God in some supernatural way and that we would simply pray and make ourselves available to God. What we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about a small step also, and that is that we would actually do something from our prayers. Last week, I remember talking to you about, hey, we might be the answer to our prayers by actually doing something, not just praying for people, but being used to uh, to witness to them and share with them and show God's love. Well, tonight I want to talk about what are some examples of that one small thing that we can actually do, one small act. So I'm talking about our actions, okay? As believers, what are our actions that will show and reveal the love of God to other people? And let me start by talking about, in general, uh, kind of the nature of our behaviors and our actions in the first place, because this will tie in directly to what we see in the life and ministry of Jesus, our actions, you know this to be true, our actions expose what's really important to us in our lives, don't they? Our actions reveal what our priorities are. I mean, that's just the truth. In the end, we only really do what we want to do. Now, I know we like to play the victim. I know we like to say, well, I have to do certain things that I don't really want to do. But the truth is, in the long term, nobody can pressure you without giving without you giving them permission to do so. Nobody can make you do something, even in your world. I mean, ultimately, we have choices, and our actions reveal what our choices are. People will say, well, I don't have the time to do that. Well, that's not, a, that's not an accurate statement. You do have the time. You have as much time as anybody else does. 
you're choosing not to take the time to do. See what I'm saying? So actions reveal our priorities. Next, actions reflect our attitudes. Jesus made this connection between what is going on in our heart and our motivations between what we do. So Jesus said, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus said, you will know the tree by its fruit. So we can understand our own motivations by the things that we do. There's this connection between the inside and the outside. Our face, our body, our actions reveals what motivates us in the end. That's why to change someone's behavior, counselors have to focus on what is on the inside. What are the motivations that are going on? And that results in changed behavior. The other thing that's true about actions is that in time, actions not only reflect attitudes, but actions can develop attitudes. Actions have the potential to build desire within us. By doing the right thing, we begin to feel the right way. You see, the power of actions. Discipline builds desire. I didn't feel like getting up this morning, but I got up. (laughs) And as I got up and did the right action, I began to feel right about that action. People have said, you know, it's much easier to act your way into a feeling than to feel your way into an action. I think that's true. If we run around to feel the right way, then we'll never act. But if we act, then our motivations, our emotions, our feelings catch up with our right actions. So discipline builds desire. Action builds desire. And if we will commit ourselves to do the right things, then those desires often will follow And we'll have the right desires also. So again, last week we talked about prayer and the power of prayer and how we are to pray that one small prayer of God, use me, send me to those who need you. This week, we're going to talk about actually, again, doing something. So as we look at Matthew chapter 9, we're going to see a summary statement by the gospel writer Matthew about the life and ministry of Jesus. As I mentioned to you last week, it's like Matthew takes kind of a pause and he gives this parenthetical statement about the summary of Jesus' life and ministry. And here's what it says. We're looking in verses, excuse me, let me go back here. We're looking in verses 35 through 38. Here's what it says. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages. Okay, now let's stop right there because I want us to get this mindset around the action of going. We're talking about going tonight, being willing to go. We're talking about an orientation of the heart and mind of going and having an other's focus. And we see this in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus went, and that says, it says huge amounts of things about the character of God. We'll come back to that in just a second. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And here's the verse that we looked at last week. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest field. Going to those who need Christ. It's an action of our lives, it's an orientation of our lives that ultimately will build a motivation to be used by God. So as we look at the life and ministry of Jesus, what we're going to see are three things I think that are really important for us to assimilate into our own lives. When we see Jesus going, the fact that it says here in verse 35, Jesus went, that reveals, first of all, a divine priority. We see a divine priority. We see that it was deep in the heart of God to be willing to send his son to us. Uh, Again, God having this other's orientation, this other's mindset. And it's found not only in the heart of God, but it's exclaimed by him to us. As he was, we are to be. As Jesus went, we are to go. Remember the Great Commission, Matthew 28 Jesus, some of his final words on this earth to the disciples, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Go is the idea. Boldly go. Unashamedly go. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus would say right before the ascension, he would say, you shall be my witnesses. 
in both Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. There is a go orientation in the heart of God, and he commands each of us. It goes to the heart of who he is, the motivation of God. Think about this. Think about this other's orientation, the God-to-man orientation. Theologically, this is so important. We see it in creation. This world was created for you and I to enjoy and to steward. This whole creation was a part of God's desire for you and me. The self-sufficient, all-powerful God created this world and created us so that we might relate to him and know him. Isn't it amazing that God who is autonomous and self-sufficient would actually extend himself to human beings in this way. It's true in the giving of the Bible, the God-to-man orientation. God provided this record of his works in human history for you and me, toward us, for us. It was true in the incarnation of Christ, Jesus being sent to this world to be born as a human being. It reveals the heart of God, a God-to-man orientation, him coming to us to speak to us on our terms, on our turf as a human being. The death on the cross was God-to-man, Jesus laying down his life for us, the resurrection of Christ, that we might not just be forgiven of our sins, but as Christ was raised from the dead, that we might live in the new life of power and victory over sin and death. That was for us. The Holy Spirit being granted and bestowed to you and me that God 24-7 lives within believers and he desires that he dwells within us you see deep in the heart of God is this orientation again of going to us for us for our sake and God expects that of his church and he expects it of you and me we were never blessed to only enjoy the blessings for ourselves We were blessed to be a blessing to others. You know what happens to churches that forget the mission and the priority of God to share the gospel? They die. They become social clubs and holy huddles. There's no new life breathed into that. There's a lack of power. Think about a football team that practices and practices but never plays in a game. (laughs) Never shows up to play on the field. Some of you are thinking about your favorite sports team right now. I'm not talking about the Texans, by the way. (laughs) Okay. Uh, They study the playbook. They have great pep rallies. But they never go out and play. Eventually, those teams die. Those teams turn on each other. (laughs) Those teams get discontent with each other, and that's what happens to the church that forgets. So God has this in his desire for us to be what he is as well. Spiritually lost people matter to God. This is the whole point. Spiritually lost people matter to God. They should matter to us. And Lord, help us to never forget that. So there's a divine priority. Secondly, that divine priority, according to Matthew 9, 35 through 38, is based in a loving motivation. Look here at verse 36. This is so good and so powerful. If you read between the the words here, you're going to see the heart of God. When he saw the crowds, Jesus had this amazing ability to see individuals in the midst of crowds. I've known preachers who like crowds but not people all that much. The big difference. To Jesus, people were the big thing. Individuals, when he saw the crowds, look at what it says. He had compassion for them because he saw them as harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Look at this progression. Jesus went. As Jesus went, he saw. That's the proper order. Remember, the proper action leads to the right results. I may not feel like going, but I know I'm to go. I'm commanded to go, so I go, which means I get myself up next to people who are far from God, who need the love of Christ. I prefer to be in my holy huddle. I prefer to isolate and insulate myself from those sinners out there. But God has called me to be a difference maker in this world, to be a world changer. And so I get up next to them, hoping that my desire will follow. And as I go, then what happens? I begin to see them as God sees them. I see them with the eyes of Christ. He went, he saw, and what resulted? He had compassion for them. He loved. 
his desires, his emotions, his feelings caught up with his, with his actions. So seeing people, noticing them, seeing them with the eyes of God is the first part of all this, and it reveals a loving motivation in the heart of God for you and me. So what does frustration and impatience and insensitivity for others and with others say? Well, it says very little about them and a lot about us. Uh, this is a safe place for me. I, you know, I've admitted to you, I've confessed my sins to the Brook Church about how poorly I do in traffic. And I don't know why. And you know how, and I, I teach at a Bible college on the other side of town, so I have to drive once or twice a week to the Southwest Freeway, 59, and the other side of town, the 610, all that area over there. And it's like God has me there for the reason of working on my heart. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. Nothing works on my sanctification more than being in bad traffic. And if you people who are slow would just get out of the left lane, I'd be okay. But that's not going to happen because I've just learned that's not going to happen. So what I've been trying to do <laughs> over, over the years is as I kind of pass people is to not just think about the car, the, the person, you know, the, 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 the situation, but to see the person and to ask God to help me see people, not objects, but people to love. If we could have the eyes of God in this respect, then I think we could have more compassion for those who are far from him, less frustration, less impatience, and more compassion. And then finally, so we see a divine priority expressed in loving motivation, but then also expressed in practical ways, expressed in practical ways. Let's go back to verse 35. So remember it started by saying, and Jesus went, how did he go? He went through all the towns and villages doing what? Teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, then we can summarize that to say Jesus was all about the message of the gospel. He was teaching, he was preaching the message of the gospel, but that wasn't the only thing he did. And healing every disease and every sickness every affliction and we know that Jesus met practical needs he fed people he healed people he cared for people he loved them and he also shared the message of the gospel his saving love with them so here's what we see if we want to know what we are to do as we go what are we to do we are to have both the message and the ministry of the gospel not one without the other. You see, both are important. Folks, it's easy to be a message-only church, isn't it? A truth-only church. Truth, no grace. Words, no actions. Condemnation, no compassion. Spouting platitudes, but not serving people. These churches share the gospel, but they often do so. Void of love that should accompany the gospel. It's easy to be a message-only church. But listen, it's also easy to be a ministry-only church. Just being kind and good neighbors. Grace only, but no truth. The love of God, but not the holiness of God. A relationship with God without the need for repentance toward Him. These churches serve, but they often do so void of the saving power of the gospel. That God is transforming human lives in a supernatural way through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the message of the gospel. The redemption of Jesus. Churches like this count cheap the cross of Christ by minimizing its need. Let's just love people. So we need the message, and the ministry. You need that in your individual lives. As you seek to reach those who are far from God, you need the truth of the gospel and the ministry that accompanies that truth. Why? Because this is, this is fact. This is reality. Ministry brings credibility to the message of the gospel, doesn't it? Ministry, ministry gives moral permission for us to share the gospel and it grounds it 
in a loving motivation to do so. So, as Jesus went, we are to go. We're talking about one small act, our actions, our behaviors. Last week was prayer. What, are one, what is one small act that we can do? This week on Facebook, I ask all my friends on Facebook to share ideas of what they have done in ministering to other people. I got such a great response from people, and people wrote back and said, these are some of the ways that we've shown love to other people in our neighborhood, our workplaces, those kind of things. Well, first of all, just notice them, show interest and talk with people. I think that's kind of a basic, right? (laughs) We should be okay with that. Uh, Bring meals to welcome people into the neighborhood, cookies, assist them with a project, assist them with moving in. Go to the hospital to visit someone, attend a funeral, being present with them in the time of crisis, write notes, notes of affirmation, Congratulate them for celebrations. They have a kid that graduates from high school or for college, a wedding, a birth, that kind of thing. Celebrate with them, but also weep with them when they weep. Pray for them and let them know that you've prayed for them. And then pray with them. One person said this. She said, I found out that our neighbor's son was leaving for boot camp over the weekend, and I know that they are very close-knit family. So on Monday, the week before, I dropped off some flowers and chocolate covered pretzels and let them know that we're praying for their son. One small act. Somebody else said this. We've posted sticky notes. Left an encouraging sticky note or message scripture for a friend, a family member, coworker, stranger, at work, on a car, in a doctor's office. So simple, but God knows who needs to get it. An extra tip for the waiter. Ask for a waiter, the clerk's manager, and then tell the manager what an awesome job their employee is doing in front of the employee. I think these are great ideas. When we say prayer before the meal, ask the waiter how we can pray for them. Pay for the person behind us in the drive-thru. You guys have maybe been a part of that. Seek to meet a material need. And then we have some friends from South Africa. Some of you remember Lodi and Rihanna Wedgemode. Uh, They were here in our church for a few years, and they moved back to South Africa. Well, Lodi responded to me. She said, with the poor state of service delivery in South Africa, people often take their frustration out on the garbage men. (laughs) I've started opening my window when they're on our street and just waving and thanking them for what they do while I drive past. Their response is amazing. Now they honk and hoot at me. (laughs) <laughs> when I drive past and have even picked up my garbage only and left the rest of the street. <laughs> she said, the word tells us that we are all equals in the eyes of God and taking out our frustrations on people that are merely part of a broken system is not godly. Isn't that true? Sometimes we're frustrated with people, but they're a part of a broken system and they can't help it. They're doing the best they can. Such a small thing, she says, but it seems to make such a big difference. The truth is, folks, we just need more old-fashioned kindness in our world. And it begins with going up next to people who need the love of Christ, seeing them, and then doing as Jesus did, sharing the message of love along with deeds of love. I'm going to show you a video now that illustrates this very thing, an act of kindness by a young man. And I think, particularly when it's not logical or easy to do, we need to show kindness, and I think this video illustrates that. Vince Lombardi famously said, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. He never met Merrick Bush, but Steve Hartman did on the road. Get a piece of him, get a piece of him! As a state champion wrestler, Merrick Bush has very few real competitors. But the sophomore from Central Valley Academy near Utica, New York, does have at least one rival, a junior from Indian River named Logan Patterson. Merrick met him on the mat earlier this month. I practiced hard that entire week, and I wanted to beat him. Terry Cavanaugh was the referee. I've been in sports a long time, and I've never seen anything like it. As expected, it was a great match. Until, with just about 30 seconds left, Logan twisted his elbow. Oh, oh my God. Up to that point, Merrick had been losing, 
But Logan's arm was now so badly injured, there was almost no way Merrick couldn't win. So he told his coach, I got this, and went back in to do what he says he had to do. That's Merrick in the blue. Again, all he had to do was stand up and pin his hobbled opponent. But instead, Merrick did nothing. He just told Logan he was sorry about his arm and surrendered. Logan couldn't believe it. He just sat there. He didn't move. You think it was goodness out of his heart. He's a great person. I know it makes me look kind of like a weakling, but... No. That's all right. No, it doesn't. No, he's no weakling at all. I mean, state championships come and go, but that, you, you can't take that away from a kid. The crowd watched on their feet and through blurry eyes as Merrick lost the tournament but won the admiration of everyone in the gym. Most especially, Rob. Yeah. His dad. Yep. Bob. I'm very proud. It's not about winning all the time, it's about doing what's right. And he did. More importantly, Merrick thought doing the right thing would make him look like a weakling, but he did it anyway. Now that's a powerful kid. Steve Hartman, on the road, near Utica, New York. Doing acts of kindness, doing goodness for others, often takes place at our own expense. And we'd like for that not to be true. <laughs> but giving really isn't giving if it doesn't cost us something, right? And giving and serving and loving is the heart of Jesus. We're never more like Jesus than when we give, when we serve, when we love. So my challenge to you this week to us, is to commit ourselves this week, I'm not talking about in the future, I'm talking about this week, to one small act of goodness and kindness that will show the love of Christ. Here's what I want you to pray. To say to the Father, I will act to show the love of Christ to someone who needs you. I will do it. I'm going to talk about it. I'm not just going to pray about it, but I'm going to do it. In fact, we can apply it even in a deeper way. This week, I will do this. You fill in the blank to show the love of Christ to John, Mary, whoever it is whoever God puts on your heart, that you will do something this week. Pray about it. Ask God to put on your heart what to do, and then do it. Find a need. Meet it. As you do, pray that God would reveal the love of Christ to this individual. And if they ask you why, <laughs> say, listen, Christ has loved me, and I'm just seeking to Learn to love and show kindness to other people. That's it. And trust God with what he will do by your obedience. Let's bow in prayer. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I wonder who you're thinking about tonight. Who is it that... Um, that God has placed on your heart? Is it a family member? Is it the clerk in the grocery store, the dry cleaner? Somebody at the gym? A neighbor, a coworker? Folks, if we look hard enough There is someone around us who is in need of the love of Jesus. Again, many of you are here tonight because someone loved you in this way. Someone reached out to you in this way. Someone showed kindness to you.
What one small act will you do in the name of Jesus? So, Father, help us to be doers of your word, not just hearers. The world is full of Christians who are hearers only. And because of that, we've lost credibility. Make us doers of your word. Give us the courage and the boldness to go unashamedly. The Apostle Paul would say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God into salvation. It's good news. And one small act can make a difference when it's done in your name. So give us the courage, the faith to follow through. And we will trust you for what you're going to do with it and give you all the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.